on World News Tonight. Escalating talks. Peace talks have been taking place over one month of shelling in Ukraine and talks are to be extended even further. Will the fifth time be a charm? Find out tonight. Demanding aid. Is the West scared of Russia? Asked the Ukraine president who is ready to compromise with Russia over an eastern Ukrainian region of Donbass ahead of peace talks. Fighting for rights. Dozens of female students and teachers come together demanding Taliban to reopen schools as Malala Yousafzai claims Taliban should not get diplomatic recognition. And a starry night. The 94th Academy Awards were presented as the red carpet was dazzling with bling and blue ribbons. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Our top story today starts with the latest in regards to the war in Ukraine. Despite the humanitarian crisis worsening by the day, the rising death toll as well as unrelenting shelling and airstrikes, Russia and Ukraine have reportedly agreed to hold a fifth round of peace talks and this time in Turkey. It's been over a month since Russia launched a full-scale attack on Ukraine. Over the course of that time, Moscow and Kyiv held four rounds of peace talks aiming for a ceasefire, but which all ended without a major breakthrough. The two countries are now looking toward fresh talks in Turkey. A Turkish presidential spokesperson told CNN that the talks are expected to be held in Istanbul on Tuesday. However, that date may change as a negotiator from Ukraine earlier took to social media to say that the meeting will run from Monday to Wednesday. During the talks, Ukraine could lay out the possibility of neutrality, as well as coming to a compromise over the status of the eastern Donbas region, which is controlled by Russian-backed separatists. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky spoke of the possibility in a video call with Russian journalists. Security guarantees and neutrality, a non-nuclear status for our state. We are ready to go for it. This is the most important point. It was the main point for the Russian Federation as far as I can remember and, if I remember correctly, this is why they started the war. Meanwhile, over in the battered country, one survivor from the theater bombing in Mariupol two weeks ago told a local media outlet Sunday Local Time that the attack resulted in the deaths of numerous pregnant women and infants, though the exact number was not given. This was because the shelling struck the area of the building that was being used to shelter mostly women and babies. The survivor also estimated that at least 300 people would have lost their lives, matching the preliminary death toll announced by city officials. And Ukrainians are not only facing the risk of death, but also deportation to Russia. Citing data from Russia's National Center for Defense Management, Ukraine's human rights ombudswoman claimed Monday local time that Russian forces deported more than 19,600 Ukrainians, including some 3,000 children from the separatist regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. However, she added the actual number is expected to be higher as Russian troops are kidnapping civilians all across the country. Ukraine's foreign ministry previously announced that a maximum of 400,000 Ukrainians may have been forcibly taken to Russia. Vladimir Zelensky, who has no reservations in being candid about his opinions, took to the media to question the role of the Western powers are willing to play in this conflict. Zelensky was vocal about the inadequacy of the supplies that they have thus far been provided and listed out what would be needed to get Ukraine through this conflict. He went on to mention that said requirements would barely cause a dent in the resources at the disposal of NATO. <laughs> A visibly irritated Ukrainian president demanded late on Saturday that Western nations give him tanks, planes and missile defense systems. Volodymyr Zelensky said he wanted only a fraction of military hardware held in stockpiles and questioned whether NATO was scared of Moscow. Only 1% of all NATO aircraft and 1% of all NATO tanks. 1%. We did not ask for more and we do not ask for more. And we have already been waiting for 31 days. So who is running the Euro-Atlantic community? Is it still Moscow because of threats? 
Western nations have so far given Ukraine anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles, as well as small arms and protective equipment. But they have not offered heavy armour or planes. On Sunday, a Ukrainian interior ministry advisor said Russia had started destroying fuel and storage centres, meaning the government would have to disperse stocks of both in the near future. Appearing to partially confirm that, the Russian Defence Ministry said its missiles had hit a fuel depot, as well as a military repair plant near the western city of Lviv. Footage from the State Emergency Services of Ukraine reported to show firefighters battling a blaze at the depot. Local officials said four missiles had hit Lviv, which is just 40 miles from Poland's border. It's a relatively rare strike on Ukraine's west, much of the fighting since Russia's February 24th invasion, which it calls a special military operation, has been focused on the south and east. On Sunday, the head of Ukraine's military intelligence said Russia was trying to split Ukraine in two to create a Moscow-controlled region in the south. In a statement, Kirillo Buranov added that Ukraine would soon be launching guerrilla warfare in Russian-occupied territory. After a day visiting Jerusalem and Ramallah, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken reiterated that Washington backed a two-state resolution to resolve the prolonged conflict between Israel and Palestinians if the right conditions were met. The United States reaffirmed its view that the solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was two states side by side with peace and security for all. At the heart uh, of all of this is an ongoing, enduring commitment to the uh, basic principle of the two-state solution. That's what U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah on Sunday. Blinken is visiting Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories ahead of a rare summit between Israeli and Arab representatives from Morocco, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates. Significant diplomatic strides under the Abraham Accords normalized relations between Israel and several Arab nations, but peace talks between Israel and Palestinian representatives have stalled. Abbas made clear that Palestinian demands have not changed. We stress that it is important for President Biden's administration to abide by the two-state solution. Stop settlement activity and the violence by settlers. Preserve the historic status quo in Al-Aqsa. Prevent unilateral action and also reopen the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem. The run-up to the summit has been marred by recent violence. Two Arab gunmen were shot and killed on Sunday after opening fire and killing two civilians in the Israeli city of Hedera. A car and knife attack in Beersheba last week left four dead. Furthermore, the United States has reaffirmed that they will maintain sanctions on Iran to prevent the revival of their nuclear program. Additionally, Iran has insisted that taking the Revolutionary Guard Corps off a U.S. T uh, terrorist list be part of a revived nuclear accord, but has been rejected, according to the U.S. Special Envoy for Iran. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has promised Washington will work alongside its allies to stop Iran from producing nuclear weapons. Blinken made his comments ahead of a special gathering with his Israeli and Gulf Arab counterparts where the Iranian deal was expected to be top of the agenda. We are both committed, both determined that Iran will never acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, the United States believes that a return to full implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is the best way to put Iran's nuclear program back in the box that it was in, but has escaped from since the United States withdrew from that agreement. But Robert Malley, U.S. Special Envoy for Iran, announced that the U.S. will maintain sanctions on the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and the Islamic Republic's ideological army at the Doha Forum on Sunday, much to the disappointment of Iran's leaders. IRJC is a national army, and a national army cannot be listed as a terrorist group. And certainly it is not acceptable. That is very important for Iranians. Tehran has stepped up negotiations in recent months to revive the 2015 agreement. The European Union's top diplomat, Josef Bure, says he hopes a deal will be possible and that world powers could iron out their issues in a matter of days. 
Ever since the Taliban government came into power, subsequent to the withdrawal of U.S. troops, women in Afghanistan have been the subject of severe restrictions and limitations. Yet another instance is the deprivation of secondary education to women. The protesters that took to the streets against this made it clear that these actions cannot be justified on a religious basis and is a violation of their liberty. Dozens of female students and teachers marched in front of the Education Ministry in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, on Saturday. The women held signs that read, Education is our right, against the Taliban's decision to shut girls' secondary schools just hours after reopening them earlier in the week. The Taliban's decision backtracked on their previous commitment to open high schools to girls. And after the decision, the United States abruptly cancelled meetings with the Taliban in Doha that were set to address key economic issues on Friday. Sources told that the talks were to include discussing hundreds of millions of dollars of funding currently held in a World Bank trust fund that is earmarked for Afghanistan's education sector. At the Doha forum, activist and Nobel laureate Malala Yousafzai had this message for the Taliban. I would just say one thing to the Taliban, Talabul ilmi farizatun ala kulli Muslim. Seeking education is a duty of every Muslim. I, I believe in peace talks, I believe in dialogue, uh, but I also feel that at the same time, uh, you know, that they should not be recognized if they do not recognize the human rights of women and girls. The U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan said on Saturday he was hopeful that there would be a reversal of the Taliban's decision in coming days. Let's go into short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Brazil's far-right President Jair Bolsonaro launched his re-election campaign, telling thousands of cheering supporters that opinion polls were wrong and he's sure to win this year's election that pits good against bad. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro may be lagging in polls ahead of this year's election, but at this rally launching his campaign for a second term, Bolsonaro was determined to leave no doubts that he would win October's upcoming vote. In front of thousands of supporters, the president lashed out at recent polls, showing him trailing behind his political nemesis, left-wing former president Lula. There is a saying that a lie repeated a thousand times becomes true. But I will say something now. A liar poll published a thousand times will not make the president of the republic. The right-wing leader's bid for re-election comes as he continues to face widespread criticism for his handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Brazilians are also grappling with rising inflation and high fuel prices, challenges that could boost the chances of Bolsonaro's main opponent, Lula. Convincing angry voters will be a tough feat for the president, but for his supporters, their minds are firmly made up. Bolsonaro says this year's election pits good against evil. He warned voters against the threat of corruption and communism that he claims Lula's Workers' Party represents. Last year, a judge annulled a corruption conviction against the left-wing leader, opening the way for him to run again. French far-right presidential candidate Eric Zemmour attracted tens of thousands of supporters at a rally in Paris two weeks ahead of the French presidential election. To get more details on this, let's cross over to Altadarana World News Pressure Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna, who joins us now from Normandy in France. For more, Chetana, over to you. Yes, Shanali. Zemmour, who is known for his strong positions on issues including immigration, criticized incumbent President Emmanuel Macron's government for their fatalist approach to crime. The crowd responded by chanting murder Macron, but Zema later said he condemned their response. The area near the Eiffel Tower previously served as a rallying point for French President Nicolas Sarkozy in 2012 and François Fillon, candidate for the right-wing party Les Republicains in 2017. Zema, a former journalist and a commentator who has been convicted for inciting racial hatred, has seen his positions in polls go down. Zema said he aims to bring immigration to zero if elected and cut taxes for their working class and companies. 
while abolishing inheritance tax on family businesses. He also said he would pull France out of the integrated military command of the NATO. French President Emmanuel Macron, a centrist whose policy making has drifted to the right, and Le Pen are front runners in the first round of the election. Polls show. In a rerun of the 2017 election, Macron is favored to win the final round. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidhar Nawal News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. South Korea and the United States have concluded North Korea disguised last week's launch of an existing ICBM at that of a new larger one. They believe the missile launch was a Wasong 15 instead of a Wasong 17 that the North claimed it tested. South Korean and U.S. intel agencies believe last week's ICBM launch by North Korea involved a Hwasong-15 missile. According to multiple sources, the Hwasong-15 was disguised to look like the newer and larger Hwasong-17, which is dubbed by watchers as, quote, a monster missile. The Allies' joint analysis was based on input from intelligence assets and shows the missile had two engine nozzles, like the Hwasong-15 the North test fired back in 2017. The Hwasong-17 has four nozzles. The analysis also showed the engine combustion time of the first stage rocket was similar to that of the Hwasong-15. However, military authorities noted the missile fired last Thursday flew a similar trajectory to the Hwasong-15 test fired four years ago, but at a higher altitude and for a longer distance. South Korea's military intelligence also believes the launch video later released by the regime was actually a patchwork of earlier footage from the previous tests of Hwasong-17 variations. On a related note, North Korea may be preparing a nuclear test as it seems to be working on a shortcut to a tunnel at its nuclear test site in Punggye-ri. If the North goes ahead with the provocation, it would be Pyongyang's first known nuclear test in four and a half years. According to South Korean government sources Sunday, it has detected signs of the North restoring Tunnel 3 in the mountainous northeastern region. Against such a backdrop, pundits say the regime may test a small tactical nuclear weapon that can be loaded onto ballistic missiles sometime around April 25th, a key national holiday commemorating the founding of the Korean People's Revolutionary Army. Hollywood's brightest stars hit the Oscars red carpet in high style on a spectacular sunny day in Los Angeles as the movie industry celebrated the years in films and the A-listers brought their fashion game to the Dolby Theatre. Red was the standout color of the night, sequins were plentiful and the men of the Tinsel Town once again did not disappoint with some daring color choices with some showing the support for Ukraine in Russia's ongoing invasion. Best Picture was awarded to Koda. Actress in a supporting role was given to Ariana DeBose for the film West Side Story. Actor in a leading role was awarded to Will Smith, King Richard. There was also drama on the occasion as Will Smith stormed the Oscars stage and struck comedian Chris Rock across the face for joking about his wife in a moment at the gala that immediately went viral and left stunned viewers questioning if it had been scripted or genuine. Chris Rock, presenting the Best Documentary Prize with a short comedy routine, had cracked a joke comparing Jada Smith's tightly cropped hair to Demi Moore's appearance in the film G.I. Jane and suggesting she appeared in a sequel. In a moment that triggered awkward silence and confusion in the Dolby Theater, Smith strode up to Rock and slapped him before returning to his seat alongside Jada and shouting profanities. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says his regime will further develop powerful strike means to boost its national defense capabilities. Kim made the remarks at a photo session with scientists and officials who contributed to what the regime claims was a successful test firing. Thousands of young demonstrators across the world took to the streets to demand action against climate change. China has announced its biggest citywide lockdown since the emergence of COVID-19. Shanghai is being locked down in two stages over nine days while authorities conduct through testing. 
For the first time in weeks, there were fewer than 200,000 COVID cases in South Korea. Officials do think that the country has, by now past the peak of severe cases, remained relatively high. Local residents in Bangladesh, capital of Dhaka, said the prices of essential goods had increased, affecting preparations for the upcoming holy fasting month of Ramadan. The increase in prices has been the Bangladeshi government offer commodities at subsidies rates for low-income residents. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. Just in case you couldn't watch us on air, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. The Academy Awards returned in full force and the red carpet was back to something resembling its glamorous best too. We are leaving you tonight with Beyonce's opening performance of her Oscar-nominated track from King Richard, Be Alive. Thank you for watching us again. Good night.